Okay, so the first uh, sort of case study we're going to be looking at in ecosystems of the living world section is the Amazon rainforest. You'll end up with quite a large diagram covering quite a variety of points, okay, and it will look something like this. What we're going to do now is we're going to break it down looking at the individual sections and add in a bit more detail in uh, when we talk about those. So our case study for uh, tropical rainforest is uh, pretty straightforward, it's the Amazon rainforest. Now what's really important is that we remember exactly where it is so we can describe the distribution of it. Okay. Now if we imagine the circle here is our earth, a bit basic I know, but the important thing to remember is that the uh, tropical rainforest is mainly found or generally found between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn at roughly around 23.5 degrees north and 23.5 degrees south of the equator. So you can use that kind of terminology, you can say that the tropical rainforest straddles the equator between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Important to remember is that there is only one little exception to that, is that uh, there is very little or virtually no tropical rainforest found in eastern Africa, even though there is an area obviously of eastern Africa in between the tropics that uh, it, it just simply doesn't have the tropical rainforest. Some of the other key things that we need to remember uh, are some of the climate characteristics of the tropical rainforest. It's on the equator, so therefore it has very little seasonal variation in temperature. We're looking at temperatures of around 27 degrees Celsius. And more importantly as well, some of the key facts are that it has incredibly high rainfall. We're looking on an average rainfall of around 2,500 millimetres a year. That's because obviously at the equator we get a high amount of solar insulation, which means there's rising air at the uh, equator and above the tropics. That's part of the Hadley cell. And what happens is that air rises up as part of the Hadley cell. It obviously cools as it gets higher up into the upper atmosphere. That cooling leads to condensation, which leads to cloud formation and heavy rainfall. So that explains the high temperature and then the, the high rainfall. Okay, so the first section we're going to look at then is the plant and animal adaptions to the physical environment. Now really important to remember when we talk about adaptions to the physical environment is that we need to consider both the climate and the soil. They're the two really kind of driving factors or controlling factors behind how plants and animals survive in this environment. Importantly to remember is that the tropical rainforest has four very distinct layers. Up in the top we have our emergent layer. We're looking at trees there that can grow at roughly 40 metres high or further. That's then separated uh, to another layer below it called the canopy. Now the canopy is that kind of really thick layer of vegetation that you'll see uh, kind of from those aerial shots of rainforest where you're looking straight above uh, or down from a uh, helicopter or something like that and you can't even see the ground through it. The canopy is really, really thick. Below that, you'll have the under canopy or the understory and below that, the forest floor. The big, obviously, major difference between these layers, obviously the height of the vegetation, but the amount of sunlight that they receive. Obviously, the emergent trees right at the top will get the largest amount of sunlight, and then that sunlight will decrease as you go down. The forest floor may only receive somewhere around 2% of the sunlight that's hitting the emergent and canopies due to the thickness of that canopy layer. Now, the major adaption of most tropical rainforests is this idea of growing incredibly tall and straight. So we can see here, our drawing shows a really, really significantly tall tree okay, with very few branches on it. We have one branch up here, but as you can see, the lower part of the tree has very few branches. This is so that the tree can focus its energy into growing upwards and in so doing so reach the sunlight, which will allow it to photosynthesize and produce the maximum amount of energy it can. Now, the other major adaption is something that we call a drip tip leaf. Let's see here. Now, as we know, rainfall is incredibly high in the tropical rainforest. We're looking at roughly around 2,500 millimetres of rainfall a year. 
What the rainforest vegetation does is it has this drip tip uh, designed to its leaves that allows water to run off of the leaves. This is really important. Without this, the weight of the incredibly heavy rainfall may cause the stem of the leaf to break under the weight. And on top of that, if water was to collect on the leaves, uh, it could lead to the growth of bacteria, which would therefore prevent the leaf from uh, being able to photosynthesize and create the energy the tree needs. Another thing that the leaves do is that they fall throughout the year. In places such as the UK, uh, we have temperate deciduous forests where the trees will lose their leaves once a year in the autumn. In the rainforest, they lose their leaves uh, regularly throughout the year. This is so that they end up with a large amount of what we'd call leaf litter on the forest floor. Here lots of dead leaves building up. That is incredibly important because what happens is in the hot and humid conditions of the tropical rainforest, those leaves will uh, rapidly decompose and their nutrients will end up going into the soil. The common misconception is that tropical rainforests have really fertile soils due to the amount of uh, vegetation and biodiversity they have grown in them. But actually, they have something that's called a latter soil. That is actually, or otherwise known as red soil, is actually very infertile. The really high rainfall of the tropical rainforest means that most of the nutrients are washed out of the soil, okay, in a process that we call leaching. This means that the leaves need to constantly fall, turn into leaf litter and decompose to replace the nutrients that have been rapidly lost. This results in a very thin, nutrient-rich layer at the top of the soil. And the rest of the soil is actually significantly infertile with very few nutrients in it. The tropical rainforest vegetation gets around this by having something that we call buttress roots. Now these buttress roots spread out along the surface rather than going deep down into the soil. This means that they access that top layer of nutrient rich soil rather than going deeper down where the nutrients are lacking. This means that the tree has those nutrients to put in towards growing and creating its own energy. On top of this, the buttress roots create a wide and stable base that supports our really tall emergent trees in uh, high winds. More specifically, uh, we can start talking about some particular types of plants as well. And we have something that we call lianas. Now, lianas like those vines that you see, uh, kind of, you know, the, the comedy ones of like Tarzan and uh, stuff swinging on them. What they do is they grow up trees. They focus all of their energy into growing upwards towards the sunlight. That means they actually grow incredibly quickly, but not particularly wide. They therefore are unable to support themselves. So what they do is they wrap themselves round the emergent trees using the tree to support to get up towards the sunlight and therefore access it to photosynthesize and create the energy that they need. One of the other plants that we have growing in the tropical rainforest is something called that we call an ephyta. Now these are incredibly uh, clever plants. What they do is they grow up on the trees. Rather than growing in the soil they take their nutrients from uh, basically the tree, they're what we'd call a parasite, meaning that they live off of something else, they live off of the tree, they get their nutrients from it, and their moisture, the, the, the water that they need from the high humidity of the atmosphere in the tropical rainforest. This means that they don't need to grow in the soil. That allows them to grow high up on the emergent trees and therefore access the sunlight. Moving on to animal adaptions, uh, we're going to look at some specific uh, animals that live in the rainforest and able to survive in the physical uh, environment and challenges that that poses. Uh, one of those is the howler monkey, which we've got here. Now, the howler monkey is really well adapted to the tropical rainforest. What it has is what we call a prehensile tail. That means its tail is able to grip and it's able to use it as an extra limb. It can therefore swing from branch to branch high up in the canopy. And the reason it wants to live in the canopy is this is the area that receives the most amount of sunlight. Therefore, 
has the highest amount of uh, biodiversity and uh, fruits and other edible vegetation which the howler monkey will uh, use to survive. It also has very long limbs to further help it move from branch to branch in the, in the canopy. But if we can definitely get that term of prehensile tail in there, that is really important. One of the other animals that we have is the free toed sloth. I'm trying to draw it there with those kind of free uh, sort of large toes or claws that it has on it. Now, what the free toed sloth has that allows it uh, to survive in the rainforest is some similar adaptions to the howler monkey. Again, it has incredibly long limbs and these really long, strong claws that allows it to grip and climb in, uh, high up in the canopy of the rainforest, again, where the vegetation, um, where the biodiversity and uh, food sources are highest. What it also has and is really quite interesting is that it moves incredibly slowly. Now, at first you might think that would be a disadvantage, uh, but what it allows it to do, or what happens, is because the rainforest climate is so humid, with so much moisture in it, and very little wind blow the canopy to blow that moisture away, um, sort of uh, moss uh, can start growing on the fur of the free toes sloth, and that actually allows it to camouflage into its environment. So it becomes very difficult to spot for predators, and actually that helps it survive. Okay, we're going to move on to looking at deforestation now, obviously probably one of the major sort of uh, news and political items regarding the tropical rainforest and particularly the Amazon. Uh, first off, we're going to look at the causes and then we're going to move on to looking at some of the impacts of that. So first off, we'll start here. The major reason for pretty much all of tropical rainforest deforestation in Brazil is due to the significant amount of debt the country is in. The rainforest uh, provides a huge economic uh, source of uh, income for the country and therefore deforestation is normally driven by a desire to uh, increase that income. For example, we will have logging, particularly for valuable timber such as mahogany which is a hardwood and can be sold at very high prices once made into furniture. Underneath the Amazon is also some very valuable minerals such as gold which are regularly mined for. This mining is normally in the form of open cast mining as well where they just kind of dig out the, the ground, they take off the surface layer of the soil, cutting down the rainforest or the, the vegetation to make room for that. The predominant cause of deforestation in the Amazon rainforest is cattle ranching. Awful at drawing cows, apologies. is a significant contributor to deforestation in the Amazon. And the issue with cattle ranching is what happens is you cut down some of the rainforest to make room for your cattle to graze on the grass. And for a short period of time, you'll have an incredibly fertile soils, uh, which will provide uh, you know, really healthy grass for your, your cattle to eat. What eventually happens though, is that uh, leaching becomes incredibly high because there's no uh, tree cover, no vegetation cover from the canopy to protect the soil from the heavy rainfall and very quickly the soil will become nutrient poor and therefore that area for cattle ranching is then unusable. That means the cattle ranches then extend into another area of the rainforest and subsequently further and further cutting down more and more rainforest. All of these major causes of deforestation also generally involve road building. Obviously the mining companies need to build roads to get their lorries in and out, as do uh, the timber companies, and obviously the cattle ranchers need access to their farms. So we normally see road building also as a significant contributor to deforestation. Other causes also include things such as urban expansion. Obviously Brazil has an increase in population and urban expansion, the building of larger towns into the rainforest is also leading to deforestation. Moving on to the impacts of it then, obviously in geography we'd like to be able to categorise our impacts. So we're thinking economic impacts, social impacts and environmental impacts. Now, necessarily we normally think of impacts for deforestation as negative, and though that is the case for many of them, it isn't always the case. One of the major economic impacts is the fact that Brazil is using the income gained from cutting down the rainforest and sending things such as the mahogany or the gold that's mined underneath it to reduce the debt that they owe. Socially, however, the impacts are generally more negative. 
we have seen Amazonian tribes that have been living within the Amazon for hundreds of years being forced off their land due to having no technical legal ownership of the land and therefore being told that basically their land is then going to be used to cut down and uh, to be sold off. One of the other big issues is the increased contact with outsiders. Lots of Amazonian tribes will have an excellent immune system designed to fight off rainforest uh, illnesses. They're not used to the illnesses that maybe we suffer from on a regular basis in the Western world and that our immune system has adapted to. So we see that with that increased contact with outsiders, those diseases may spread amongst the uh, Amazonian tribes and can lead to uh, sort of really poor levels of health and even in some cases death. One of the positive social impacts, though, does link to our deforestation causes. The building of roads to gain access for the mining companies and logging companies is actually benefiting local people. It's making the rainforest more accessible and therefore they are able to get around much easier. Environmentally, however, the impacts, as you would expect, are pretty negative. We're obviously seeing, with a decrease in rainforest cover, less CO2 being taken up by the trees and stored away. That's increasing the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, which we know will be a significant contributor to global warming. Also, what we're seeing with the removal of the rainforest and the vegetation cover of the canopy, as we said earlier in terms of the cattle ranching, we're seeing an increase in soil erosion and the process of leaching. Remember, that's where the nutrients are washed out of the soil. What happens when you've got the rainforest uh, vegetation, the canopy provides that protective layer above the soil and actually intercepts a large amount of the rainfall. That means that the leaching is minimized. You remove that away, you see the leaching of the nutrients rapidly increase and on top of that soil erosion. We've also seen obviously a massive loss of biodiversity. The more rainforest you cut down, the more uh, habitats you're destroying and therefore the less biodiversity there is likely to be. The exam may also ask you about the value of the tropical rainforest. You can really break that down into two areas, either the goods or the services that it provides. Now, the goods are the products that are created and therefore can be sold, maybe to make uh, a sort of financial income for people living in the rainforest. Uh, obviously, the most sort of obvious one that you could think about is probably uh, logging. So the provision of hardwood such as mahogany, as we said, can be sold for high amounts of money once made into furniture. So therefore selling that is obviously a good that the rainforest provides. It also provides food products such as bananas and a lot of the flowers that grow in the tropical rainforest, their scents are used in the creation of perfumes that are then, or aftershaves, etc., that are then sold uh, in the high income parts of the world. And the major good it provides, though, is that the tropical rainforest is the basis for around a quarter of all prescription drugs sold globally. Uh, you hear quite regularly in the news the idea of the concerns around tropical rainforest that we may be destroying a cure to diseases that we currently haven't been able to beat. Now, the service that it provides is really important. The tropical rainforest is a huge carbon store. It takes in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and traps it within its biomass. That means that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is reduced, which is helping us in our fight against climate change. Obviously, as we cut down more and more of the tropical rainforest, the amount of carbon dioxide it's able to take in is reduced, therefore increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which could be a contributing factor to increased uh, rates of climate change. Now, the last thing that we're going to look at is the management. We've looked at how important the tropical rainforest is in terms of its value. We've looked at the causes of deforestation and the impacts. We're now going to look at how we're trying to manage that and reduce that. So if we kind of draw in a few new trees to show that we are trying to help the rainforest because it is vitally important that we reduce deforestation. So we're looking at this idea of management. Now, management is likely to come up as one of your nine mark questions. So you're unfortunately not going to get a simple command word such as describe how tropical rainforest is managed. You're going to get something like along the lines of evaluate to what success or assess how successful management strategies are. So what I would always recommend doing is ranking your strategies so that you're showing that consideration of whether or not they work or not. The first strategy that we look at is selective logging. Okay. Now there are important things to consider here. This is done on a local scale. And what it is, is in the Amazon, Selective logging companies will only cut down 
a certain tree. They will normally take the mature trees, the ones that are at their full growth and therefore the most valuable. This therefore should allow younger trees to carry on developing and should keep in place the majority of the canopy cover, which will therefore prevent any major soil erosion and high rates of leaching that we talked about earlier. The problem is it isn't particularly effective. I'd rank it as the least effective, the third most effective of the three strategies we got here. That's because what happens is when you cut down one tree, obviously as it falls and as it's dragged out to the road, it damages a huge amount of other trees. Research shows that roughly around 30 other trees are damaged for every one tree that is selectively logged. The other issue as well is that the selective logging companies have to build roads to access the rainforest. And what happens is once they've left, other companies come in and clear fell, which means cut down the entire area after them. So in like 75% of areas in the Amazon rainforest that have been selectively logged have been completely felled within three years of the selective loggers leaving the area. Another strategy is the idea of ecotourism. Now this is actually better. It's more effective. Basically what ecotourism is, it's designed at providing a holiday and a form of tourism that is designed to protect the rainforest. So people going on an ecotourist holiday might be uh, provided on education on how important the tropical rainforest is, going back to our values, uh, value of it and our goods and services. They would also maybe be involved in activities such as uh, afforestation, so replanting trees or monitoring the numbers of endangered species. This therefore allows them to play a role in supporting the rainforest and protecting it. We also find that mainly educated people normally uh, have the right intentions of trying to protect the environment they're in. The only issue with ecotourism is for it to be truly eco, it is normally on a small scale. You're looking at maybe 20 people per ecotourist resort. That means you have a very limited audience that you're going to be making an impact on. The best strategy is our debt reduction or cancelling of debt sometimes known as carbon credits. What happens is rich countries, you take the USA or the UK, uh, they cancel the debt that is owed to them by Brazil. Now remember we said that debt is one of the major causes for deforestation. And what they do is they cancel that debt in exchange for something called a carbon credit. Rich countries, high income countries like the, uh, the USA will have a carbon cap, amount of carbon dioxide that they're allowed to put into the atmosphere. Now if they exceed that, they may be fined and therefore, obviously, it's something they want to avoid. However, it's very difficult as a high income country to not cause carbon dioxide emissions. So what they do is they cancel the debt that Brazil owed them in exchange for Brazil conserving part of the rainforest. That rainforest, as we know, then takes in carbon dioxide. So our high income countries can then argue that though they have emitted too much carbon dioxide, they played a significant role in ensuring that some of that carbon dioxide is taken back in and stored out of the atmosphere. As I said, I put this as probably the most effective strategy. This is because it works on a large scale and global scale. It works for both parties. Brazil reduces its debts, which reduces the need for deforestation, and it helps high income countries reduce their carbon emissions. So there you have it. You should end up with a really quite large diagram, but consider taking into consideration all aspects of our Amazon rainforest case study.